Well, hello there, and welcome to Roundtable. I'm your host, Adam Cook. This week, we're going around the Richmond Municipal Council table once again, as we share some items from the latest meeting of Richmond's Committee of the Whole. We're going to take a deep dive into weather conditions here in the county and how the municipality should be reacting. For example, are public works officials from the province doing enough to clear your roads? And as well, what should the county be doing in terms of comfort centers to alleviate the concerns that many people have when the temperature takes a steep drop or when there's major snow or rainfall or when the power goes out as it so often does this time of year. You're also going to hear how a decision by the provincial government impacting the Halifax Regional Municipality could have implications right here in Richmond County, including the municipality's desire to spur on more housing development here in the area. But we begin with a look at a special survey being conducted for seniors in different parts of Cape Breton Island, including Richmond County. Richmond and Victoria counties and the Cape Breton Regional Municipality are partnering with several officials from Dalhousie University to carry out the Acting Collectively survey process. It's carried out all over the world, and you're going to hear over the next couple of minutes some comments from Dalhousie University representatives of the local Acting Collectively survey, including the Faculty of Health's Dr. Grace Warner. But we begin with some opening remarks from someone you likely know very well from her work with the Seniors Take Action Coalition and similar initiatives right here in the Strait area. Let's hear from the local project coordinator for Acting Collectively, Celeste Gotell. I'm the local project coordinator and it's my pleasure to welcome all the team from Dalhousie um, who are going to actually be doing their presentation this evening. So, uh, with me, we have Dr. Grace Warner and Dr. Anna Packer from um, Dalhousie University, and we have Brianna Wolf, who's the research coordinator, and Bria Pierre, who is the research assistant. So, over to you, Grace. So, thank you very much for inviting us. We're really happy to be here and to share what we have. So, I'm just going to go into this. So, what we're going to do is first is a big overview, kind of refresh you on what the project's about. Um, the project's local focus, that's going to be, that's Celeste, that's all about Celeste. And then uh, we're going to do a little bit about the progress. So we'll kind of go from the big picture to the more kind of, uh, more details, which is, you know, for us, a little bit of the results makes it kind of become a little bit more real on what we're doing. And we thank you for being, you know, partners in this project. We're really, and it's, it's exciting to us. So for first, the project overview. So we do consider this a, a, it's a community project. So we're all partnering on this. So as you can see, you know, yourself is the um, participating uh, municipality. So Richmond and Victoria and Cape Breton uh, Regional Municipality. Uh, we have us at Dalhousie University, and then we have some initial kind of like a start up with a Brick Nova Scotia, which is just a research network. And then older adults, of course, are partners, and we're partnering with Northwood and Park. And then also our funding is coming from the Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care, and also Nova Scotia Health. So we all feel as a team that we have a big obligation to be able to be very, to kind of find some useful information and to feed it back both to you and to the problem. So this is the big picture. This is our vision. I like to think of it in kind of three different sections. There's the individual, there's the municipal, and then there's the provincial. So first off, what we're doing right now, and Celeste is helping us with this, is to systematically collect um, the care needs at the individual level. So we're in the process of recruiting um, some adults, and I'll give you some more details on that right now. Older adults, 65 and over, in each of the three municipalities. Um, for each one of those adults, there's an assessment, and those individuals are giving an um, individualized care plan. I'm sorry if I look over to the side sometimes, but I'm looking at my other screen over here. Uh, so these individuals' care plans will have information for the individual on independent social connectedness, health, and well-being. From that information, what we're able to do is aggregate it and then create these reports for the municipalities, what we're calling community profiles. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that um, with more details. So the hope is that maybe you could identify the strengths and weaknesses of 
you know, the community resources, you get a better understanding of what the older adults in your municipality consider their concerns. And then we, we got some linking about some of our questions to um, domains in the age-friendly community. We're also going to be sharing all these results, of course, with Nova Scotia Health and the Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, we've already met with them several times. Uh, just to let them know what's going on because they're very interested to see what we can gather in the community and they're very interested to see where they're going to be investing funds they're already talking about that in terms of communities where are they going to create hubs for older adults for services you know for example in the valley there's a entity called Cora, which is a, kind of a, a partnership with uh, Delta social community college and it's created a hub for older adults so they're already looking at how they're going to do this in other places. So some of our research will inform them. And this is a slide about why. So the tool we're using, so, so it's a, an interview type format, and it's 56 questions, and then it's from the age care technology. So it's, we call it the ACT tool. Uh, so that's the ACT tool that kind of has these 56 questions and it, each of those questions can be divided into the domain that I talked about previously, which is your know, well-being, independence, or could be called social isolation, um, and then health, and, uh, yeah, and social isolation, so WISH score, it's called the WISH score. This particular tool is from uh, the UK and it's been tested in over 50 countries and it has over a million people, people over 30 years. So that's why we've chosen it because there's some established use of the tool. The WHO uh, has endorsed it, so that's why we particularly chose this tool. So the act assessment, the questions, like the domains that I just talked about, well-being, independence, social engagement, health, can also be mapped onto age-friendly community domains. So even though I'm going to be presenting information kind of aggregated towards what we call the WISH scores, it can also, we can divide up those questions and also look at things that are indicative of age-friendly communities. So the overall goal of the project is to assess the usefulness and the feasibility of implementing what I the actual in the three municipalities in Cape Breton. So you know, Richmond, Victoria, and Cape Breton regional municipalities. So now we're getting more into the details of what this is about. We plan to interview, we're hoping to interview 480 community dwelling older adults that are 65 years and older yeah, from the three communities. And from those, you know, once again, I said there's the individual level, and then there's the community level, or the municipal level, and then the provincial level. So the idea is from those separate interviews, each one of those individuals will get individual action plans. Uh, and you'll see an example of that a little bit farther on. Uh, then we're taking that individual level, and we're aggregating it as what we're calling profile of community needs and resources. And this is something we really wanted to talk to you about in terms of what do you want in the community profile. We, we don't have everything all packaged. We are waiting for some input from you to figure out what would be helpful to you in Richmond. And then we have an assessment. We are researchers. We're a little bit of a kind of evaluation here. So we do want to know if it works. It may not work. Uh, we don't know. We're testing it. We're testing, are they good questions? Uh, can, how is it, how they, are they getting good information? Do people like the uh, individual action plans? Or what do you think about the community profile? So there is an evaluation component uh, to see, you know, what if our hope is that when we leave, when the researchers leave, we could, you know, have communities gather their own data because, as Celeste knows, a lot of individuals have been trained as active assessment. So this is a, so that's part of what we're doing also is to evaluate did this work? What about it worked? What about it did not work? So now I'm going to go over to Celeste. Uh, so Celeste, I'm turning it over to you. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as you all know, um, the municipality of Richmond uh, applied for an age friendly grant and, and were one of the successful uh, recipients of the grant to do this project. And 
Um, as they have in the past, they partnered with the Dr. Kingston Memorial Community Health Center, which um, has a has a great reputation and is known for doing some really great work with supporting older adults. So they're actually kind of the, the operator, or if you will, on behalf of the municipality. And they brought me in uh, because of my involvement with working with older adults to act as kind of the local community coordinator. So um, as uh, Grace indicated, we have 10 trained assessors in Richmond County um, that are available to do the interviews. Um, three of those assessors are actually bilingual. Um, Michelle McPhee, for example, is one of our assessors uh, <clears throat> who you all know with the Senior Safety and Social Inclusion Coordinator. And a few of the other assessors are folks that all of you would know and are, are known to people in Richmond County, many of whom are uh, retired nurses, a couple of whom are actually still doing some nursing. So I think one of the important things to mention in terms of the work here is that um, this does build very nicely onto the idea of an age-friendly community, which that has been identified as one of the priority areas in your in your newly revised strategic plan to look at um, the services and programs you offer with an age-friendly lens. So. When the time comes to actually prepare these reports, as Grace indicated, there'll be an opportunity for us to kind of dig down deeper in terms of some of the findings and align those with the different domains of an age-friendly community. Um, one of the unique features in providing this in Richmond County is that um, we actually um, are, we do have a significant Acadian population and, and we're uniquely positioned to be able to offer the interviews in both languages. And the Dell team has been very supportive in ensuring that we translate things. So those are just some of the key uh, things that I wanted to mention. But of more importance is how you can support and promote this project. So I mean, if I was going to ask you, if one of you wanted to say, well, how can we get behind this project? Well, my answer would be like, you know, when you sell real estate, they say location, location, location. <laughs> well, if you're going to sell this project, it's promote, promote, promote. Every opportunity that you have to talk about this project in the community with older adults, we know that there's over 3,000 people 65 years of age and over living in Richmond County, and we only need to recruit 150. So I guess I'm, you know, I think one of the ways that you can, as a council in Richmond County, is continue to promote the project. I thank you for what you've been doing to date. Um, it's great that we're able to get all our social media information on the Facebook pages and um, also that you've all been very supportive when I reached out to you and asked you to get uh, some new posters up. Certainly the um, Richmond Reflections has been running an ad and we'll have it in bilingual format for the next issue coming up. Uh, we did an interview at Telio. Uh, we're going to continue to do a little bit more promotion there. We did get some really good media coverage as well locally. Um, again, supported by the, the uh, Dow team. And um, <clears throat> I guess, to me, one of the, the most important things is going to be word of mouth. Because what we're finding is that we're six months into recruitment. And I can tell you, although we've been very successful in Richmond County, and we'll be providing the numbers shortly, it's a, it's a slow go. Um, so I think as people hear about it and they know that it's not a painful process to be involved in this, that they'll be more likely to step up and volunteer. So that would be what I'd be asking of all of you is to really kind of, when you're, anytime you're meeting with somebody, just ask, have you heard about this project and refer them to us because we can provide them with more information to um, let them know more about it. So on that note, I think I'll just hand it back over, and then you can talk about some of the local numbers, perhaps. Yeah, that's the, the hope, to make it a little bit more concrete. So the project uh, progress. So these are, so far, these are Richmond County uh, numbers. So uh, we have two different graphs. One is the registered participants and the assessed participants. Uh, so I want to thank both uh, Bria and Brianna for creating these graphs, too. So, uh, so far we have uh, 31 out of the hopeful 160 or 120 that we are able to recruit. 
Uh, so the registered participants means that they have um, been screened to make sure that they are eligible, which means they have to be 65 years and older in D.C. Richardson County. Uh, and then they've consented. Because it is a research project, so we do need to get consent. So that's always the first step. After that happens, then they're handed off to an assessor. And so 24 of those, uh, 24 have been assessed so far. Uh, so this is good. I mean, really started heavy into our recruitment in, I would say, end of November, beginning of December, would you say, for that? That makes sense. Yeah, thereabouts. And I, I forgot to mention that interviews can take place in three different ways. Um, they can be done on the telephone, or if somebody wants to do a Zoom one, they, we can facilitate that through our, our team at, at Dell, or they can also be in person, and um, we've actually made arrangements with 10 community uh, locations um, who have graciously offered space if we need to, throughout the county, as far away as Grand Boys, um, to conduct in-person interviews with any of our assessors. Thank you, Celeste. That's good information. Yes, yeah, and uh, Celeste, has, Celeste has been working tirelessly uh, to get this going. So those are the first numbers, and then we have an example. This is an example of the individual action plan, just so you can see something. So this is what the individual would get. Um, they go through the 56 questions, and then they determine if they have a concern in each of these questions. Like, for example, can you see with glasses if worn? And uh, then if they indicate they have some difficulty, uh, and they indicate that this is a priority for them, then some resources that are in the database pop up. And uh, Celeste and her team have been very helpful to supply us with what are the local resources. We've also connected with 211, so we've gotten resources from them. And so this is just an example of what the individual would get in terms of their action plan. So the idea is this can be given to them, they can share it with their doctor, uh, they can go in and act on these things. And see if you know, see if it you know is helpful for them to identify. It also is helpful for identifying what's not available. So we know that there are never enough resources. So the idea is that we also can identify what are the concerns that don't have any resources attached to them. Uh, this is some of the data. This is some of the you know we don't have that many people right now, which is why we're trying to recruit more people so we can give you better information about the individuals in Richmond County. Uh, so you see the orange uh, bar is well-being, uh, the blue is independence, the darker blue is social engagement, and the yellow is health. So as the uh, values for these scores, those are our wish scores, what I was talking about. Uh, so when you see that the turquoise, I guess, for independence, is at low risk. So those people that we've been interviewing so far are at a very low risk for problems of living independently. Uh, but if you look at the well-being, which is the orange one, then that one is that the people are that we've interviewed so far are at moderate risk for uh, problems with well-being. Uh, so this just gives you some of the example of what some of the data we can put together. And I'm just going to get like now into the next one, which drills down into that. Because the well-being score was shown to be at moderate risk, this shows you a little bit of what we can get for this. So we can analyze this data based on the question level. So we know from this data that 91% of the individuals indicated they have difficulty with at least one question in the mental health domain. There are like six different domains of questions that we ask. 50% or 17 of the participants out of 34 had trouble sleeping, you know, within the past month. 41% had been suffering from a recent loss or bereavement, and 38% have had concerns about uh, memory or forgetfulness. So this is just an example of some of the data that might be of interest in terms of what does this mean for the community, what are the people going through, and what resources might be available to address those needs. Grace, just I wanted to point out that what you just shared there, the number of participants is reflective of Victoria and CBR as well, because we, we've actually got 24 completed. Um, not 34, so just oh, so that folks know that. Oh, I apologize. So that is the whole piece of 34. So apologies there for that. So. Yeah. So okay. Sorry about that. I'm so looking ahead. I just figured you already have 34. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So this is yeah. So this is the whole one. So so there we go. So there we go. Sorry about that. Apologies. So. So with 32% of the population in Richmond County is uh, 65 or older, 
Uh, so that is an important piece that you know in Richmond County. Uh, so we're collecting the data on the um, common concerns. Um, and then what we really need to know is what you want in your profile. How, do we, how should we aggregate the data in a way that's useful to you? Uh, so that's one of the things that we do want to talk to you about. So that we can make sure we give you back something that you can do something with. So this is kind of what select with do. So how can you help? Uh, we do want to recruit a variety of people. Right now, we're getting a lot more, as it always happens with these kind of things, you're getting a lot more healthy, independent individuals. So we'd like to have a spectrum across Richmond County of people who are having issues and people who are not having issues. We hope to have, that's why we want more people to within our spectrum. Uh, so any ways we can uh, help with recruitment during this time, so we can get a little bit more people. Uh, I think it's the last few been through most of these things, you know, that you've already discussed. Um, introduce, discuss the project. Um, yeah, and this, I think the bottom line is we really want to know what should be in the community profile too. So helping us to be able to, you know, give you what you want and make sure that we can get to a variety of people to make sure that our numbers are representative of uh, Richmond. And there's a lovely poster uh, that's been created uh, by the team. I know you have a lot to talk about, and it's the evening. I'm sure you're already thinking about, you know, onto the next agenda. But if you have some time to give us some feedback, then I'd be very grateful for that. The presentation was excellent. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, so as you're talking about the participants, um, and we're talking about like accessing them and, and chatting with them. My feeling is, and I think you did sort of say something about, you know, that these were some of the more, for lack of a better word, healthy or, or active members of our, of our communities. And I'm, I would be interested to get more information from members of the community that perhaps struggle with different daily activities. And so I just, I, I I struggle with how we can access the information from them. Like my feeling is that a third party person may be the answer to that. So when you talk about registering and you say, are they 65 plus and do they live in the county? But like, for example, if I wanted to do like a survey for my father-in-law's needs, for example, right? He couldn't have those chats with you because he wouldn't hear you well enough to talk with you for an hour, right? But, you know, is there a way that we could do it that if someone in that person's family was willing to sort of be the mediator or something that we could do some surveys with those folks? Because I think they're the people that are really the most in need and that we really need to find out what they need the most. That is an item that we've had extensive discussion on, Melanie, so thanks for raising the issue. Um, there are provisions made that if somebody wants to accompany somebody like that, that they can actually be kind of that conduit of information, but it's important that the individual who is impacted is part of the interview process. So that was identified by a number of our assessors, um, many of whom you would know. There are people in the community that are very well connected. Several of them have worked in long-term care and continuing care. So that can be arranged, and maybe that needs to be part of our promotions going forward. We may, may need to spend a little bit more time thinking about how we can start communicating that so that caregivers or an adult child or a spouse or what have you can also um, support an individual in participating in the interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have that ability, so people can either A, you know, I mean, like as Celeste says, we can go to the individual's home and do that, have it through phone if that's okay, but in your situation that you were talking about, you know, that so uh, like a wife or a child could be talking on behalf of someone else, and then we would mark it that that person is talking on behalf of someone else. So there are different ways of addressing that, but we do definitely want to get that person, get those mm -hmm. people who have those issues because, and they're the hardest yeah. to be able to get. So that's why, you know, recruitment is one of the hardest things. It's kind of like, first off the bat, it's always the people who are healthy and say, you know, this is, you know, something I'm really interested in. You know, if it's a, you know, someone is having some difficulties, it's a bit harder mm -hmm. to do these things. But, you know, whatever way we can make it easier for them, it, we will do it. Let's put it that way. We will do it to make it easier. Here's how the Acting Collectively Program Coordinators responded to a question from District 1 Councillor Sean Sampson 
regarding the exact number of interviews to be coordinated within the counties of Richmond and Victoria and the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. The project is three years, okay. but we've done one year of engagement, right. but we do have two more years to do it. It all depends on, you know, uh, how long it takes right. to be able to do it. No, and that's 480 for the three different communities. Yes. So, not, so Richmond is not, you know, just 480, but yeah, that's, that's our hope. Yes, correct. Yeah. So now is that divided equally or is that uh, from a percentage of the population more or less? Like there'd be more in CBRM or out of the 480? Why or? didn't you choose uh, like 480? Yeah, is it 160? Is it 160 right across the board or is it? It's 160 for each community. Okay. Right. Okay. So to do equally, of course, if you want more, you know, that's fine. <laughs> And yep. then if people, so some other people may not make that target. Right. So right. I guess that's, that's our goal, is to have 160 from each of the communities or municipalities. Yep, cool. Thank you. And I, I can see where, where, where you're getting at there, is that the population of Richmond County is considerably lower than CBRM, and you're absolutely right. But a, a particular note is that we're leading the pack. Mm -hmm. We've got the highest number of people who have actually participated, and so, you know, as I've often said to many people about Richmond County, it's the little engine that could. Yeah, cool. Our next portions of this week's edition of Roundtable are going to deal with the weather and specifically what Richmond Municipal Council, in conjunction with its provincial partners, can do when weather conditions turn sour in our area. In just a couple of minutes, you're going to hear what different councillors think about comfort centres setting up around the county and whether the county should have a coordinated policy to deal with these comfort centres and make sure they're managed properly. But we begin with this discussion on snow removal in Richmond County. It was sparked by District 1 councillor Sean Sampson, who has several concerns about snow clearing in Isle Madame. Here's Councillor Sampson to kick off the discussion on whether the Department of Public Works should be doing more in Richmond County. I want to start by saying, I mean, this is not the first time we discussed this around this table, and I just want to stress that, again, I'm not knocking any local operators or local supervisors or anything like that. Uh, I think it uh, takes a lot of courage and guts to get behind the wheel of a snowplow during a snowstorm, so hats off to those guys. But... My concern is that the, this approach of so many hours after a snowstorm of, of clearing roads is, is is putting lives at risk, putting people at risk, and uh, and uh, I've gotten many calls the last couple of storms of people that can't get out of their lanes, people that can't get to work at Clearwater, you know. So it's a uh, it's a it's a tough situation. Uh, like I said, I. Uh, you know, I, I know the approach right now is so many hours uh, for. 100 series highways, so many hours for roads, and then so many hours for by roads. But when you're talking about 24 hours or so before you see a snowplow on a by road, it's uh, it's it's you know if it's snowing heavy, uh, you're you're kind of putting the people in in those lanes at risk, right? So uh, I know the approach, and, and I spoke to our local MLA, Trevor, and I know the approach is to open Highway 206 and Highway 320 on this island, uh, which means they go to the end of Bourgeville, they go back out, uh, they go to the intersection, which is the intersection near my house, 320 and 206, and go back towards 320. Uh, so, you know, there's that road that's open uh, to the end of Bourgeville and then back out, and then to my intersection and back to the schools. Uh, so there's no lanes open. You know, I forward you photos of, of you know, the intersection at the St. Joseph's Credit Union in Perigra, uh, that that road uh, from the end of Butterville towards Arishat is like a summer day, and uh, the road going towards the bridge and Alderney Point and Little Lance is uh, solid ice and snow covered, you know, so a couple of weeks ago or, you know, last week or so, there's kids that didn't even go to school because their parents wouldn't put them on a bus, right? Mm -hmm. When Highway 206 and 320 were bare pave, right? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, people that work at Clearwater, uh, you know, they got two kilometers of smooth sailing uh, when they're going to work at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, if they're coming out of the point or they're coming out of Little Lance, if they're coming out of Cape Laron or Rocky Bay, um, they hit Highway 320 or they hit Highway 206 at the Credit Union Paragraph, they got the stretch. So they got two kilometers. Once they hit Veterans Memorial Drive, it's no covered. And, uh, Cape Oak is stone covered, right? So 
Same thing with Route 320. If you're coming out of Rocky Bay, you get the Pondville stretch. That's bare pave or opened. And then the low road and Veterans Memorial Drive and Cable is not open, right? So, uh, yeah, for me, uh, my my opinion is this. I mean, if it's if it's not snowing that much, you know, it would allow us operators to, to go in these lanes because the snow is not going to gather that fast if it's not snowing that much. If it's snowing pretty heavy, you have to get in those lanes every two times because if you're waiting to go 24 hours, you're not getting in that lane with, a, you know, with any kind of emergency vehicle at all, right? I, I witnessed, uh, and hats off to him, I don't know who he was, uh, but I witnessed uh, one of the operators open Breakwater Road in Little Lance. Um, all you could see was the sign that said maximum 50. You couldn't see the base holding that sign. That's how high the snow was to the sign. And he uh, he worked on that road for about 15 minutes or so to try to get into that road uh, because they hadn't been in there in 24 hours, right? So if that's an ambulance or a fire truck, we all know what the result is going to be, right? So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's a very dangerous game. Uh, I think uh, we're putting lives at risk here, and uh, I would like to see the province um, come out with a better approach. I don't know what that is. If it's more equipment, more operators, uh, I don't know. But uh, I know that uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's something that's got to be addressed, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I will say I heard from a councilor from a constituent in. Um, and actually your, your district councillor, Melanie Sampson, um, about snow clearing on the Evanston Road is expressing some similar safety concerns and um, just ha you know, happen to be able to connect with them just after the storm. And um, You know, certainly you're making a great point. Um, I do, you know, I do wonder about how effective it is to be writing letters um, when, you know, these policies have been in place for some time yeah. and maybe we need to change our strategy and look for, a, you know, I, I know that some councils do a quarterly, quarterly meeting with uh, Department of Transportation staff in their, in their regions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe we need to uh, pursue something like that. I mean, I think we do need to put it on the record if you have concerns and if council thought it would be a good idea to, to write a letter, but I just wonder what else can we be doing? I know we are all in touch with Department of Transportation staff individually on a regular mm -hmm. basis, but maybe, uh, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if dynamic would help. for me, if you really want to hit home with the, the Minister of Public Works and our provincial government, um, I would ask them this question. I would say, I would ask, you know, what is the main focuses of the province today? And I think we'd all agree that it's health care, housing, and roads. And I think they got to come to realize that all those are linked to each other. Mm -hmm. We got very good groups and very good volunteers and hard workers that are trying to recruit and retain health professionals. Uh, and they work very hard to do so, uh, but then they find that it's hard to find housing mm -hmm. for these people. If they become lucky enough to find housing, and it's in a beautiful subdivision that they can't get out of, or their kids can't get on a bus safely to go to school, I think the provincial government has to realize that all these things are linked to each other. And if you don't improve the roads, where are we going to go, mm -hmm. right? Right. So I would like to see us write a letter to the uh, Minister of Public Works and stress these concerns and stress safety. And um, again, you know, I've been told that, you know, if something would happen in, in one of these lanes and one of these roads, that they would dispatch a snowplow right away to get to this emergency. I've had this discussion with uh, with our MLA and I told him, uh, you know, the prime example I can give him uh, is one I witnessed myself uh, when I was living on the high road. There was a tractor trailer going to Clearwater, uh, stuck in the hill in Cape Oak. Uh, fortunately, it was just, I shouldn't say just lobster, but it had a refrigerated truck, right? So the reefer was on, the lobster wasn't 
getting affected, but the truck was there for an hour. So they did exactly that. They dispatched the plow to come there, salt the bottom of the hill for that tractor trailer to come down the hill. Then it has to get around the tractor trailer, salt the hill, salt the top of the hill for the tractor trailer to get up the hill. Mm -hmm. That's an hour. If that's an ambulance or that's a fire truck and not a lobster tractor trailer, mm -hmm. someone's in deep trouble. Yeah. Someone's house is gone or someone has passed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, like I say, I, I, I hate to be that, you know, severe, but I think um, it's eventually going to happen with this approach. Mm -hmm. So, councillors, would you be supportive of us putting a piece of correspondence together um, for the minister, um, just expressing these concerns and maybe with greater urgency, uh, increasing urgency than we have in the past? Um, is that something? I think, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, in reference to some of Sean's comments, uh, you know, some, some I'll agree and some I'll, and before we answer that question, I, I think yeah. we'll, uh, just to put a little perspective on the, um, on the length of time, just the other night alone during the big storm, maximum traveling speed was about 10 kilometers per hour in the snowplow because of visibility. When you look at the leave from the Marinick plow shed to go to the 104, and right to the 320 on one side of the road, you're looking at even say 15 kilometers. So it's two hours one way, two hours back. So it took you four hours just to do that one road. Before you even left to go on to a side road or an alternate route, the side that you've already plowed has almost a foot of snow back on it or six, eight inches. And for that reason- It was an extraordinary amount of snow. Yeah, yeah. Right, and, and visibility, it's not always the snow, it's visibility. Yeah. So you have to remember if you can't travel any faster, then you can't plow it any quicker. So just to put it in perspective a little bit, now I'm not saying in all cases, you know, that's the, uh, that's the deal, but one thing I think we would have to check before we, you know that saying, before you shoot yourself in the foot, you better make sure that the gun's not pointed. Um, I would wanna check to make sure that we're paying for what we're getting, I guess, or we're not getting more than what we're paying for. Because I believe we do, fund Department of Transportation, right, through? Our contributions, right? Our yeah, like the municipality for maintenance. Purge, for maintenance. Yeah, so our is, our, is our J-class roads or our K-class roads that are being plowed by transportation part of the cost? And if it is, then I think we really want to check, are we getting more than what we're paying for or are we getting less than what we're paying for? Okay. That's something we'd have to review yeah. for sure. And I don't know. I'm just, once we open up that can of worms, if we're getting more than what we're paying for, then we better be, mm -hmm. we better get ready for the repercussions of that's your road now and we're no longer even looking at it. That would be my concern. Okay. I don't think we're only talking about the roads that are municipally owned and serviced by... Yeah, right. no, no, no. Councillor, no, no, no. is that no, no, no. provincial? Yeah, we're talking we're about talking, some no, roads I, that are provincial. Yeah. So. But, but uh, most of these side lanes are not provincial. No, most of them are. Like, we're, them. we're talking even dirt roads. Like, you know what I mean? Like, even Loch Lomond, Framboise, Forshoe up that way, you know, these folks have to wait a long time sometimes, and it, it, it doesn't feel fair, but I understand that there's only so much equipment, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of kilometers to do, mm -hmm. right. and I, I, I can't dispute that. Um, I can agree with the frustration, but the, the, the J-class roads, I don't think they would only represent a small percentage of, of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. I don't think that has, I, I, unless I misunderstood. No, 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 yeah. Yeah. no, no, these are, these are provincial roads that are being followed by the provincial rules, right? Mm -hmm. 12, 24, <coughs> you know, 8, 12, 24 mm -hmm. hours, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, and, and I understand where you're going, Councillor Diggin, when, 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 I see the snow plow coming and all I can see is the caution light and I can't see the plow itself yeah. because of wind and, and snow. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be behind the wheel of that thing. You know what I mean? I, I know where you're coming from. It's just for me, if, if, if it's smooth sailing and it's clear and you can see um, and, and it's not snowing that that much, uh, when you're going to the end of the point or the end of the road, the end of the lance, I feel there's no reason why you can't get in one of those lanes or two of those lanes and then your second time around and finished the other two lanes that you didn't do or whatever, but to to avoid them for 24 hours straight and then try to pound your your snowplow in there like I like I witnessed the other day, 
that's a that's a tough one. So I'm just looking for some direction at this point from folks. Yeah, I'd like to put like a to motion, motion forward, uh, Madam Borden, to, to send a letter to the, our Minister of Public Works just to, <coughs> you know, what, to see what this approach is or what we can do here. Uh, I'm sure we're not we're not the only rural municipality, and you know, uh, you. Uh, we yeah, we're not yeah. the only ones, right? Uh, as a, just an alternative suggestion, I wonder if it would be possible if we were able to reach out to the MLA to maybe have a meeting with the minister at some point. I think that would be good for everybody to yeah. express their yeah. concerns on more than yeah. just yeah. snow plowing, yeah. like, you yeah. know, um, because, I mean, the, the, the government has been in place for a yeah. year and a half now, and yeah, you know, it would be I, nice I, if, if yeah. we could have a face-to-face -face meeting rather than yeah. a letter which yeah. whoever will respond to it, yeah. who knows. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I do agree with the, uh, you know, one, um, like everything else, it would be nice to have, you know, more operators, more coverage, more snow plows. Um, again, I, I, I do believe it is, you know, in our position here, um, we have to bump that rate back to our MLA and say, this is your job and we need you to fix it. Um, really because, again, we can sit around the table all day long, but he is our MLA for the province and this is provincial. So again, you know, it comes to him. So if these these guidelines and standards have been in place for many, many years, and I'm sure the province sat down and come up with them for a reason. Now, do they meet our our criteria and our requirements? Probably not. Can we get them changed? Well, we'll only know by having, you know, our MLA sit with us or sit with them and yeah. and have that discussion. Mm -hmm. And like you say, Councillor Dignan, is it more operators? Is it more uh, equipment? You know what's it going to take, right? I, I I know myself as a teenager growing up in Salmon Cove. I mean, when when the snowplow went to Little Lance, uh, that snowplow was gone for 45 minutes before it returned to Salmon Cove uh, because it did every lane. And uh, when it got to Salmon Cove, it came down our lane and did that lane as well. Uh, so I don't know where things went wrong, or I don't know where this all went sideways. <coughs> Is it more equipment? Is it more operators? I'm not sure. You know, but again. Uh, with that comes more cost, right, and more yeah. mandatory contributions to our province. There's but no question. yeah, but in the end, uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna find some sort of solution, right, before okay. things go bad. Madam Chair, if I may, um, sure. uh, in your letter, could it be an option to have a conversation with the local operations management to better understand their um, how they triage and prioritize because yeah. th as we understand the assets they have and how they have to use it and how they open it and in what order, it may give us a better understanding of why Third it challenges. takes so long to yep. get from here to there, etc. cetera. Yep. And um, it gives you guys the tools as well that when you're getting the phone call that we can try and understand yep. the true issue that is, you know, instead of just saying it's the province, right. well, this is what they're dealing with and this is how they do it. Like yep. our school bus routes, the number one priority in the hospital, is that how they send their equipment out? I'm not sure. I know that's how they do it in other municipalities. They sit down with the school uh, board every year. These are the routes for this year because people move <laughs> in and out of rural communities. And once the kids are gone off the road, that road goes to a lower priority. Right because they're not getting the kids off to school anymore. Mm -hmm. yep. So, But alternatively, that's where a lot of the people who are seniors with health issues right. tend to live. So it's Absolutely. you're just trading off one group of vulnerable people for another, really. So, right, right. you know. Yeah. But having that conversation, we can understand yeah. how they're doing it. Because honestly, I, I, I don't know what the process is here yeah. uh, uh, with our region. Okay, so um, hearing then an op option to meet with staff, which I think we had done in our early years uh, yeah. when we were first elected. Yeah. So maybe time to do that again. Mm -hmm. um, I do, yeah. you know, but then there is a, the question of correspondence at the ministerial level. Um, do we want to continue that? And, and uh, you know, maybe the Deputy Warden's point, request a meeting with her in the near future as well. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I would be. I think I'd be more inclined to request the meeting, and we can maybe see if that could go through our local MLA. Yes. Only because I, I, I could be off base here, but I feel like if we express the concerns and request a meeting, we'll get an answer yep. pertaining to our concerns, but not a meeting. Right. 
Right, right, right. <laughs> yes, I, I understand. What They'll pick the path of least resistance. Oh, yeah. If, yeah. Yeah, if yeah. They present okay. The so then, I guess the motion would be to request a meeting of council and uh, tr uh, Department of Transportation or Public Works uh, staff uh, in this region, and to further send a letter requesting a meeting with the minister. Would that summarize it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Someone like to make that motion? I made a motion. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Sean Sampson. Could I have a second, please? I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Any further discussion on that item? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. That motion is carried. Now, snow removal is only one part of the equation when it comes to getting through difficult weather conditions during the winter months. For example, should Richmond County be doing more to promote comfort centers that often provide relief for people who are impacted by heavy snowfall or rainfall, especially if there's a power outage that goes with it? Here's Warden Amanda Mumbercat launching a discussion on comfort center policy for Richmond County during the February 21st meeting of Richmond's Committee of the Whole. Really this was as a result of the last storm. As uh, we have discussed at length, it was an awful pile of snow in a very short period of time. Um, and what I had noticed on, uh, on our social media, or on social media in particular, was uh, that people were sharing uh, some comfort, comfort station lists that were only for one district and not for another. So, um, so then the comments on it would, you know, were around, oh, well, why aren't there any, you know, comfort stations in District 5, you know, and they're only in District 3. What, what's that about, you know? So I think there was just some confusion around where comfort stations could potentially be set up. So I chatted with um, a Troy about that and our emergency management coordinator to talk about how we could maybe improve the, co the communications to ensure there's no confusion. Um, and what we talked about doing was putting a link to all the comfort stations on every piece of material that we published about it. Even if it's only a list for District 3, we would still have the link for the full list C, you know, here. Yeah. And it might help to avoid some of that confusion in the future. But I just wanted to kind of bring it to everyone's attention here that if you see that kind of thing and there's an opportunity for us to improve the situation, just please pass it along and uh, between... Troy and Steve and I know they'll they'll get that figured out for us because it's it's pretty tough to to control what people are and aren't sharing on on social media right so we, all we can do is our best to make sure the information gets out there so um, I, I all yeah. if I can just to I look to the similar point um, was that the week, the time when there was the extreme cold I think and so there was some question from members of the public like what were we doing to support vulnerable vulnerable people who may be yeah I I don't know if it was in that case I'm, I'm thinking of the last big snow I'm pretty sure but anyway re regardless yeah, yeah, regardless. yeah I don't know like I just yeah. feel like I know that we were sharing some stuff on comfort centers yes. when we had that event yes absolutely um, yeah. and just talking about how the typical hours of waiting period would be waived right. because of the cold mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but I do think that it did open up sort of like an area of concern for me in terms of what are we doing for vulnerable people who may not have places to live mm -hmm. during extreme cold weather like that because mm -hmm. you know we were talking about comfort centers but the reality was is that the comfort centers as indicated by Steve were, were not like they're not equipped for overnight guests right, right? right. and so you know I and I and I am confident that he like in the correspondence we've kind of been back and forth. I know he's yeah. looking into what that would look like for us, but yeah. I guess we also need to be a bit careful with sharing information that may not answer the question that people are looking to have right. the answer to. Right. Right. Because I feel like that one, like I didn't share that because we hadn't had any power outages, and then right. we did, and then it was very short. By the time I got it up, it was it was done mm -hmm. because I'm worried about confusing people. So I, mm -hmm. you know. I, that, I guess that's all I want to say about that is mm -hmm. that, you know, I think we, we've identified that hole and I'm, I'm sure that's being dealt with, but I just, we need to also, if we're going to share, we need to be careful that we're saying what's really going to happen. And I know you had mentioned a couple of sites that were like on the list, but well, they're not set up yet with the generators. Right. Yeah. So we do have some sites that are on these comfort center lists right. yeah. so they could get funded for generators, right? And now, but they're not quite ready. So... Right. Like, yeah. You know, again, I, it's good. I think sharing more information is better than not enough, but we just, yes. like I know for myself, I'm trying to tighten up what I'm sharing to make sure that it's right. 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 
and yeah. operational. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I don't want to say this is going to open because that may not. That was the conversation we had that came out of this. Yeah. yeah. Was an operational readiness of each of these sites and only right. those sites would be, be the shared. ones that we would right. correspond to the public. Right. The ones whether you or us or whoever. And what's difficult with this as well is those aren't our sites as I know. well. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to hammer out what is the relationship yeah. and how can we trigger it once these agreements are signed yeah. so that we do have the authority to say yay or nay whether it's opening or not, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And once we have that, then it'll be a much cleaner process. Yeah. yeah. And we do have verbal agreements in place with these places, but, yeah. you know, we are moving in the direction of yeah. kind of a more a tighter written agreement. And yeah. uh, yeah. the bottom line is we're relying on a lot of volunteers. Well, of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Who, 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 when you activate a comfort station, then they're at risk because now they're out on the road. Right. And, you know, so it's, it's definitely a nuanced process. So right. Yeah. I'll be looking forward to, to seeing how that kind of continues to evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Okay. It's keeping them busy. I'm, you know, <laughs> I can only imagine that it's keeping them busy. And yeah. I feel like we're here, we're expecting another weather bomb or something. So, yeah. anyway, it could be some more snow on the on the go for this weekend. But, but um, yeah, going back to what you said, Councilor Maloney, uh, you know, just simply share what you know is because, I mean, I shared, like you said, yeah. District 1 had five of them. And then five minutes after, District 1 had two of them. Right. I was like, yes. oh, right? yeah. we're yeah. not ready, we're not ready, we're not ready, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and yeah. that's what his morning is on a yeah. lot of those, right. is personally <coughs> calling these sites to say, okay, who's ready enough right. and who's in a go state and who's not. Right. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. we may have five or six to choose from, but only one or two may be activating right. or even have the people to activate. Right. So yeah. that's his ready up state, mm -hmm. and that's what he tries to do before we post. Right. Great. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Um, any further discussion on the EMO cons? Just a shout out to the fire departments. I think yes. they're the number one. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, they yes. go above and beyond every time, and they're uh, they make sure that they're there before any other organization is there. Yeah. And that's not putting any other organization down. But the fire department doesn't matter day or night; they respond, and yeah. and they're sitting there waiting. Absolutely. Well said. To wrap up this week's edition of Roundtable, one more item from the February 21st Committee of the Whole meeting for Richmond Council. Now, this has to do with something that the provincial government recently did regarding the Halifax Regional Municipality. So, you might be wondering, what does that have to do with Richmond County? Well, as you're going to hear from Warden Amanda Mumbercat and other councillors, it could have implications on the government's ability to step in and stop Richmond Municipal Council from keeping its own bylaws going, particularly when it comes to housing developments. Here's Warden Mumbercat to explain. And this is uh, the province's introduction of Bill 225. So um, uh, for those who haven't been following that particular discussion, um, I did, I, we did include some information in the, in the agenda package. Um, but just to give a little background, that bill was introduced in October uh, this of 2022 by Housing Minister John, uh, Minister John Moore. And it amends the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter um, so that a bylaw or part of a bylaw passed by HRM's council could be nullified by an order of the provincial minister if the minister determined that the bylaw would impact housing or a development. Um, I, you know, the, the, what they were trying to achieve with this, with this new act was essentially um, you know, to do everything possible to address the housing crisis. It was specifically aimed at an HRM bylaw that was passed in last summer that could have, that would have seen the reduction of hours so that construction trades can work in a day because of noise concerns. But at the end of the day, uh, the way that the bill came out was without any consultation uh, from, you know, with HRM uh, by the provincial government, and it grants the minister um, the authority to override what is essentially a lawfully established bylaw of the municipality. Um, you know, Halifax Council, just like any of us, um, through the through their charter or for us through the MGA, they're required to follow a process for bylaw creation that includes public consultation, um, you know, public notifications through first and second readings, um, and before it can be approved. And that gives, I think, that transparency and accountability that's critical to good governance. Um, but you know, essentially, this this would bypass that whole process. Um, and so HRM and now in a letter, uh, a supporting letter from East Hance, um, 
uh, as well as from Colchester counties, have, have asked formally that the legislation be repealed uh, because it does kind of go around the authority of the municipal government. The concern, of course, number one, right off the bat, it was a lack of consultation. This was simply introduced. Um, and it is a provincial overreach into municipal matters. So there's been some dis you know, discussion around that lack of transparency. Um, and it's just being out of step with some of the democratic <coughs> principles that we, um, you know, that we as municipalities um, abide by. Um, you know, obviously an additional concern is that, you know, we are negotiating uh, the Municipal Government Act and, and the service exchange agreement with the province. This bill, you know, could potentially influence the outcome and, you know, sets a pretty, um, I, I, I guess, worrisome precedent around the lack of consultation with the municipalities. Um, so I wanted to put it out there for council to discuss um, because I, although it doesn't directly impact our, the way our municipality operates, because it was an amendment to the HRM Charter, um, it's, it is, it is a, a worrisome precedent um, as that I think we all need to be paying attention to. Um, so I just wanted to open that for discussion and suggest that perhaps we also, um, you know, consider issuing a letter of support uh, to, uh, for HRM's position to have the act repealed. So any comments or... <coughs> Question? I mean, uh, I, I would think every other day we hear about, you know, <clears throat> the housing emergency and so on and that. Um, you'd hope they wouldn't overstep with this, but I'm not sure it's the worst idea in the world, really, because we've seen how, you know, especially a large municipality like Halifax can, sometimes it may take forever to, to get these things through, where they, they set, you know, they, they may talk about wanting to to build housing, but it will take forever to get anything done and if the provincial government sees fit to, to override this feeling it's an emergency situation I don't know that I don't know that I'd have a big problem with it because I, I think we are in a severe housing shortage we've seen homelessness especially in HRM shoot up dramatically the last few years um, I think I wouldn't I'm not saying I wouldn't change my mind on it, depending how it played out, how it was used, if it felt like it was being used too easily. Um, at this point in time, I think the provincial government is seeing a problem and, and maybe trying to, to find a way around it. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. I, I definitely think it was coming from a good place. You yeah. know what I mean? There's no question. Um, I do think any time that the province is going to make an impact on municipalities, we deserve to be consulted first. And we saw the same thing with the property tax rate. Right. Right. Yeah, it's not the right. first time. Yeah. I, I I don't know, I tend to disagree with um, Deputy Warden. I, uh, again, everybody has boundaries and everybody has a place and if you're not going to follow the, uh, you know, I, I agree that if the province needs to overstep, well then, you know, sit down with the uh, HRM and then have that discussion, but at the same point, um, it pretty much defeats the purpose of even writing a bylaw if the province at any time can walk in and do what they want. Right. So it's it's almost you know you know we'll follow your rules until we don't like it and then all of, then we'll just take over. So to me that's um, yeah it's I I support sending a letter off to. Uh, and I mean we could be you know we could be conscious of that you know, the point you're making deputy ward and I think in anything that we did put forward right. and and you know say we agree with your intention to you know if your intention we, is and we want yes exactly <laughs> and we want to work with you to you know resolve this crisis we're all experiencing but right. particularly HRM you're right, right. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, this was a pretty heavy-handed tool I mean if we if we go back less than a year you know all those uh, all those homeless people, they took apart their homes. They didn't just up and build them a new one before they ripped it apart. So, you know, I, I'm living in a cardboard box as an A1, but living without a cardboard box is a lot worse, I guess is the best way to say it. So, you know, I'm not saying I don't support them moving forward with housing or them, you know, implementing or I guess overreaching if they, if that's what they're doing. But at the same time, I, I think, if they're sitting down with the municipality of HRM um, or the people of the uh, municipality, then surely to God, if right. they're looking to build extra housing, they're not going to get a, a fight from... Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I don't think it's as much the topic because I hear both sides here. I don't think yes. as much as the topic is what it is, the process. That's a concern for you and should be a concern for all of us, right? Yeah. It's the process of the way mm -hmm. it was handled, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because there could have been a way for this to be a little more amenable. Like it just could Absolutely. have went very right. differently, right? right? The same yeah. right. conclusion could have been reached right. with a different path. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't explored, and I think it's a, I think it's honestly disrespectful to the yeah. Yeah. to HR to the you know to their council. So, yeah. um, so I would support uh, writing a letter. Okay. Uh, just you know, again along the lines that we've talked about here tonight yeah. in terms of um, you know the, not happy about the process and you know understanding there that the intent the had had you know had good there was good intent there, yes. but that the process. Uh, was yeah. not acceptable and, mm -hmm. and it just undermines everything. Really, because at any point, any minister could decide, you, you know, if the government could decide that any minister has similar powers to do, like to do whatever. That's right. So that really we then have no decision-making ability. That's right. And that's not the point. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that would be my... Yeah, I mean, I guess that is my concern. Is yep. What's the next issue right. where this is going to roll out the right. same way? Yeah. You know, there are, right. And it's... it's the, right. It what's the next sense. topic? And yeah. is it the same process being followed with whatever? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 So I would support a letter to be written in that regard. Okay. So I'd just look for a motion uh, then to that effect. I'll make that motion. Great. Thank you, Councilor Melanie Sampson. Can I have a seconder, please? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Councilor Dickton. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Okay. That motion is carried. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Roundtable. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my colleagues at Te Lille Community Television, Nick Boudreau and Callan Cowan, for filming and formatting the footage from Richmond's Committee of the Whole meeting that you saw during this week's episode. If you'd like to comment on what you've seen over the past hour, or just offer suggestions for future editions of Roundtable, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly, and you can also contact Talil directly at the station in Arishat. And don't forget to follow Talil on social media. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this week's edition of Roundtable. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.